So we're here today for quantum mechanics to talk about the topic of wave packets and spreading of wave packets. Uh, we won't really do this in great gory detail, even though there's a lot of math involved. Uh, so that's why I have the kind of quippy title here. Uh, I've subtitled it Fun with Fourier because this is, uh, for a lot of people, the kind of first non-trivial example of Fourier analysis. So I'm making this video for my quantum mechanics class, Physics 460, at Cal State Dominguez Hills in the fall of 2016. Uh, sometimes when I've done the course that's prerequisite to this, which we call Physics 134, uh, I've covered this material, so you might have seen it before if you had me. Uh, not everyone covers this, and not everyone who's in a class where it gets covered really fully follows it, so I, I'm sure that not everyone knows this already. Uh, it's not so simple, but it should all be within your grasp. You should really know about plane wave solutions to the Schrodinger equation quite well by now. You should know about adding solutions to the Schrodinger equation to get another Schrodinger equation. You should have some general idea about how Fourier analysis works, even if you haven't gone through uh, examples in great detail. <coughs> well, this is going to be the detail. Uh, part of this is to give you that kind of uh, example of actually doing it. And I'm just going to jump in. I'm trying to finish this in 15 minutes, and there's a lot to do. One of my ongoing themes in almost any physics course, but especially one like this, is the idea of taking mathematical results and physical consequences and seeing how they go together. Uh, this should also help address a question that you probably had when we started talking about plane waves in the previous course. You may have even forgotten that you had it but a lot of people do. Uh, I'm going to start with that thing that I think is your question. So this is the question basically. In plane waves, where are the particles? Uh, we introduce you to plane waves. We talk about large statistical numbers of particles sometimes, and uh, sometimes the way a student might phrase this is it makes sense for a stream of particles, but what happens if I have only one particle? Typically, uh, when we reply, we don't really answer. Uh, we'll tell you that we're going to cover it later. We'll tell you that, well, this is just a different case, and it's the one we're doing now. Uh, sometimes we'll mention that it can be dealt with mathematically if we do some more math. Well, this is the more math right here. Um, to get to it, though, we've really got to say, what is a particle? Because we're doing quantum mechanics. We're doing it in the wave mechanics picture, the wave mechanics way. And we have to know what you mean by a particle. It's almost a philosophical question, uh, but it means we need to have something that's property of a wave function that we can call it a particle. I think the most natural thing for most people is just to say that uh, we're going to call uh, it a particle if it's somehow localized in space. Not necessarily at exactly one point, but somehow localized. An alternate description might be to say that it has a definite momentum, so it can follow a trajectory. And again, not necessarily exactly one value, but some uncertainty. Uh, we're going to see, this is one of the points here, those two basic pictures are the same thing. That If I talk about something localized in space, that's equivalent to being localized in momentum. As we do that, we will hopefully get some deeper understanding of what's going on with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And then what follows up, and the more rigorous part of the end that's more difficult and we won't see as well, is a preliminary look at this quantum phenomenon called wave packet spreading, which relates to a larger topic we won't get to here called decoherence. So things you need to set up the math we're going to do. You need to know about de Broglie waves and how momentum and energy relate to wave number and angular frequency. You need to know the relationship uh, between energy and momentum, of course, and how that breaks down classically. But you do need, even though we're in a non-relativistic approximation, you need the mc squared term from relativity. You need to know what a plane wave looks like e to the i kx minus omega t, 
we're using complex exponentials because it's easier. If you've seen that with a plus omega t instead of a minus, that's going in the other direction. And frankly, right now, I don't care. Uh, you need to know about wave functions and observation. That we really can calculate wave functions first, but what we observe is always related to a probability, which is the absolute square of a wave function. So I'll, I'll use all those things as we go on, uh, and hopefully you know them well. If not, stop and review them first. So when I say I want to start with something localized in momentum, well, momentum's related, as we just mentioned, to wave number. <coughs> If I have a bunch of plane waves with amplitude for their wave number, and that's why I call A for amplitude as a function of wave number, looking like some sort of Gaussian distribution, a, a bell curve, in this case centered at K naught, and with a spread that's inversely proportional to this alpha. I don't really care about what that alpha is. I just need to know it's inversely proportional to the spread of this function. Uh, Mathematically, when you run into things like this, it's common to say, well, let's deal with the case where k0 equals 0. We can displace it later. We could defend that on physical grounds, too. We're just going to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to start with this set of waves, plane waves, that have amplitude as a function of wave number given by e to the minus alpha squared k squared. And I called it alpha squared because that means it's positive, partly. Uh, and again, I don't really care exactly what it is. It's somehow related to uncertainty, but it's inversely related to uncertainty. So I'm going to write my wave function with that set of amplitudes. The sum is an integral. So I integrate with that set of amplitudes the plane waves. And I'm ignoring the timepiece for now. We'll pick it up later. So I put in what that function a of k is. And I can actually do that integral. It's not trivial. But there was a technique you learned in high school uh, for solving quadratic equations that was called completing the square. And you may have forgotten about it. But essentially, uh, in this case, what I need to show is that I can break that, uh, that thing that's being exponentiated into a perfect square and a constant. So instead of alpha squared minus alpha squared k squared minus ikx, because they both have functions of k, I can have this perfect square where it's alpha k minus i x over 2 alpha whole thing squared plus x over 2 alpha that whole thing squared. Uh, if you want to prove that, the easiest way is to go backwards. Just multiply out the right side and you'll see that it's equal to the left side. When I stick that in, the e to the minus x squared over 4 alpha squared can come out in front because it's not a function of k and k is the variable of integration parts that's left inside this definite integral <clears throat> is e to the minus some linear term in k squared integrated on dk. When I look at that, I say that definite integral is something a little bit like e to the minus u squared du. It's just a number. I happen to know what it is, but I don't really care right now. It's not a function of x. It's not a function of k. Therefore, this whole wave function, the spatial dependence is all essentially given by that e to the minus x squared over 4 alpha squared. The sum number is a normalization, which I didn't work out in the first place, so I don't expect it to be so meaningful now. This is big. This means that I've found from that set of amplitudes that was Gaussian, that was a localized, <clears throat> localized in momentum space distribution with some error, a spatial wave function that's localized in real space with some error that's inversely proportional to my other error. That's a big deal. I've proven the first point, that localized one way implies localized the other. I've also addressed the Heisenberg principle, because the two spreads are inversely proportional, therefore their product is equal to some constant. Now it's equal to, not equal to or greater than, because we're talking about a specific case. 
But this should remind you of, and it can be proven that this is strongly related to, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, I should admit that if I want to be really rigorous about this, uh, we need to check those numeric factors because we start if we started with something that was normalized correctly, it means we have one particle. That means the output should also be one particle. And we didn't check that. I'm going to claim for now it works. We could do it. It just takes too long for this lecture. So we got to move on and start talking about the time term. What happens when I let this sit there? When I had discrete cases with mixed states, as you should have run into in the previous course, you, you saw the time dependence active because the time term is specific to each different spatial state. The energy is different. Same thing here, but the sum is an integral, so it might be more complicated. So we need to go back and put the time terms in. The tricky part here, omega is implicitly a function of k, but we can make it explicit. I told you to remember about de Broglie and relativity. We can write omega in terms of e, we can write e in terms of p, and we can write p then in terms of k. So I've got omega in terms of k as some constant, which I'll call omega m, the mass-related part of omega, and some k-dependent piece, h bar squared k squared over 2m. I can go back to the integral I had for the states, that psi of x, and replace <clears throat> the omega with the omega that I just got, the mass type plus the k-dependent piece. The, there's a e to the minus omega mt in the integrand here, which as far as k is concerned is a constant. I can pull it right out front. So that new piece out front is a constant. In fact, it's a constant with magnitude the absolute square that is equal to 1. That'll be relevant in a moment. The inside piece looks a little messy, but if I shuffle things around, it's not really that big a deal in that it's not that different from what I had before. Instead of alpha squared, I've got alpha squared plus the linear term in time. The e to the ikx is just like it was before. The term in front has modulus 1, so when I, when I told you the last of the things to remember, we don't measure wave functions, we measure probabilities, which is the square of the wave function, the absolute square. That new leading term is irrelevant. It squares to 1. The integral is a mess, but we can learn a lot without actually completely doing the whole thing. Now, if we're doing it completely, again, the normalization will matter. We're not there yet. We're going to go by and see what we can get from it, without actually doing the whole normalization. We know that alpha, or alpha squared, becomes alpha squared plus the linear and time piece. We can just stick that in, into the wave function piece. We understand the e to the minus x squared over 4 alpha squared. When we do the probability, we have the absolute square, so we have to look at the complex conjugate, that is the i's go to negative i's, and we can multiply that out. Uh, it looks a little long and messy, but it's not a big deal when we just pull out the exponent and look at it. We can add 1 over z plus 1 over the complex conjugate of z. We get this real number, and if we apply it to our particular case, it's not a pretty real number, but it's a real number. It's just a function of alpha and time. Note that at time 0, it looks like alpha squared over alpha fourth, which is 1 over alpha squared. There's still a factor of 2 there. But that's not that different from what we had before. The probability then is proportional to this new function, which is e to the minus x squared plus this time-dependent function of alpha. General shape, it's the same. The width changes in time. It gets greater all the time. Location becomes less well-known as time goes on. That's the big deal. That's what we'll talk about later in class. For now, I'm going to leave this alone. You've had enough for one day. Probably want to look at this twice if you want to understand it. Thank you. Have a good time.